When buying or selling your home, call Leo Bato. He has years of experience in real estate, showing honesty and integrity in every transaction. He's a person you can definitely trust. So book your appointment with Leo Bato today by giving him a call at 818-648-4837 or by visiting him on the web at www.leobato.realtor. Rejuvenate your smile with Dr. Lourdes Kaplong's comprehensive range of dental solutions. Along with general dentistry, Dr. Kaplong specializes in cosmetic dentistry, including teeth whitening, bonding, dental veneers, and surgical crowns. Whether it's urgent care or preventive treatment, she'll take care of you and your smile. To schedule an appointment, call the clinic at area code 323-257-7582. This episode is brought to you by ABBA eServices. And the podcast will begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause live at Paco's Place. Mr. J.R. Richards. <laughs> Too kind, man. Too kind. Welcome back. Yes, I know. In the flesh this time. In the flesh this know, time. Right? Yeah, the first episode was kind of virtual. No, it, it was. It was that, really there virtual. There was about five to 6,000 miles between us last time. Yes. Think, so. Yes. And, and you know what? Like, like, as we were talking offline, this is really an inspiration to have you here. It's not every day that people of your stature say, <laughs> I'll be there and actually follow through with that, with that promise. That's right. <laughs> okay. that's, a, that's a big Yes, one. it's just... Thank you. It, well, it's an honor to be here. It, and it took a while to, to figure it out. I mean, because um, I come through California quite a bit. Yes. I mean, this is where I'm from originally, right? But uh, man, my, t- my schedule's always so tight. I'm racing from one place to the next. But um, so I'm glad I was able to. But uh, you're, you're not it. you're not based here anymore, right? No, no. I live in, I live in the UK now. So um, uh, for, gosh, eight years now. Oh. Although, But to be fair, though, I mean, well, okay. So about four months of that was spent outside of the UK. I was, in, okay. I was in France and Spain and Monaco, US quite a bit, Canada. So You and your wife or just you? Um, my wife with me some of the time, um, and, uh, but mostly me. Like I was saying we have, we have a highly special needs. One of yeah. our boys is highly special needs, so it's hard for us to both to go places together. Sadly, otherwise she'd be here right now. Ah! I know, I know. Mike met her, you, Mike, you met, you met men already, right? Yes, yeah. yes, Mike had a chance to too. She's, she's just, awesome my wife is awesome so so i'll, I'll address um the, why are you here let's 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 bring that in right now the first few minutes i ask myself know. that all the time why am i here no i <laughs> no no that, are, are that you the asking, philosophical no no, <laughs> <laughs> no i i no I, what, I, what i mean is so do you sorry being silly but do you do you mean like why am i here at paco's place, Paco's place no. or, 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 <laughs> You asked me. I don't. In the States. <laughs> why are you back in oh, the yeah, States? Oh, yeah, yeah. So why am I back in the States? <laughs> Sorry. I promise it will get better. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yes, I'll, I'll wake up here. No, I am, I'm in the States right now because I'm, I'm touring. So for, the, for two months. Uh, it's mostly, um, I, we were talking about, I do a lot of private shows. Clothes on, clothes off. Yeah. It, well, <laughs> <laughs> so far, all clothes on. <laughs> Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to do it without getting arrested. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so far it's been, um, well, it, it came out of, of COVID. Right. Really, because, uh, I mean, the last tour I was supposed to be on was in the Philippines. Yes. And I was just about to get on an airplane to fly to Manila from London. Right. And my wife, Min, came in and she said, hang on for a second. I think the uh, health minister in the Philippines just closed all of the for venues. A, for a while, yeah. Yeah, for a it, was, while. it was any venue that was larger than 500 Four. seats or four, yes. five, something yes. like that, right? 400, 500. And that was every show. Mm. I'm like, right, okay. So that's it for that. So um, sadly, because I was telling you too, that very first show, I'd been talking to Arnel Pineda and he was going to come and sing Angels of Devils with me in Manila, man, and which would have been a huge bucket list thing for me. Hopefully we could get we could get um, him and you together right, as well. Right. Good friends. Well, he and, I, he and I were talking about it. So he, and obviously he's busy. Yeah. Um, and We uh, tried calling him a while ago. I know, we did. He's <laughs> sleeping right now. <laughs> hey, which I get. He's a singer. You got to rest the voice. Right. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so hopefully, you know, depending on our schedules, if if he happens to be in the Philippines while I'm there, we'll we'll definitely uh, make it happen. Since you mentioned angels and devils, yeah, you're a songwriter, solid songwriter. 
what inspires you or what inspired you to write those songs and you've been in, you've been doing music all your life yeah yeah all my life so let's 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 start with with that song right i mean what's what inspired you to write that specific song that specific song so um well it, from a lyrical standpoint you know that part of it was it was well kind of came out of that idea of angels or devils is is kind of that 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 angel or devil that's inside each of us, right? Yes. And they're always, you know, my experience is they're always kind of fighting for who has control, right? And, you know, I mean, I grew up being taught to do the right thing and to be kind, and but you know, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you you know we make bad decisions or you might be having a bad day, um, struggling a bit, stress, those kind of things, depression. There's a lot of stuff that we deal with, right? So it's, uh, this song was just about that internal struggle that we have, you know, to try to do the right thing and, and get through life in the best way possible. And sometimes it's hard. Did you know that it was going to be a hit? No, 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 no. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, the song originally started because Jim, the keyboard yeah. player in the band, had brought me the chords to the chorus and, and he was playing it for me and I'm listening to him and I'm like, oh, it's pretty cool. I'm like, it sounds like Charlie Brown's parents to me. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I totally get it. And it took me a while to get my head around it. And then I kind of finally, and, and the other guys in the band were pretty keen, like, oh, that's really cool. You should do something with that. So then I, I took it home and, and then Angels of Devils came out of that. So oh my I God. finished writing it. So, um, but it's, it's a great song. The, the recording of it that we did as a band on Opaline 2 was, right? was really magical also. So because I think I've written songs that I oh I thought like, oh this is one of the best songs I've written and then we've gone in the studio and recorded it and it just didn't translate well you know can you explain that to me and to the audience because yeah. it really happens sometimes to the point like the demo is actually better, better yeah. than the actual yeah. recording the crappy demo that you recorded <laughs> in your you know garage or whatever is so much superior um, why does that happen you know it's just because I mean music is so emotional and um, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think, uh, what works the best is when you're able to capture that emotion and also have, you know, be in a nice studio with good microphones and those things. So sonically it sounds really good so you can hear everything well right. and balanced. Right. But at the same time, if you have to choose sometimes the, the crappier sounding version, but has all that heart, heart. and emotion Ooh. is, you know, I'm working on a song right now. Um, it for for a new album and i had sung the demo to it a few years back and i, I mean i sung on i was playing guitar and singing at the same time and, it, and i was out of tune and uh -huh. blah 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 but the vocal is so good that i did that day i can't beat it and it's driving me crazy like it because i listen to that demo and it's like i want to cry <laughs> yeah. i'm like oh my god that's so beautiful to my ears you know and then I sing it now, and it doesn't matter how hard I try; it's just it's just not quite there. So I'm not quite sure what I'm. So what what do you do when 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 those things happen? Do you do you um, compromise yourself to hit the the release date, or mm. do you have to make a tough decision? You know what? It's not working. I'm not putting it out. Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes <clears throat> sometimes I'll set it aside if it's just not there, um, because I've I've recorded en enough songs that that should have been better than they were like they just didn't translate well at that time and i probably should have just not released it and come so there are songs uh, sorry uh, yeah this is wow so there are songs out on streaming platforms that when you listen to them you're like could have done better yeah yeah that, yeah definitely. while while us mere mortals go wow <laughs> well i mean i don't know i i think that um I mean, I, I guess it's hard to say because you can't hear what's in my head. I mean, right. because sometimes I, I usually hear how the song is supposed to be. And then it's, and then the job is trying to figure out how to, to capture it that way so that I can play it for other people and they can hear it in the way I'm hearing it. But sometimes that doesn't happen. You know, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. It's, it just, and they might love it, but it, to me, I'm like, it's just, it, I know it's, it sounds good, but it could be so much better if I could just figure out how to do this or that. No. Is, do you think it's subjective or objective or both at the same time with regard to the um, the bar raised in your head? <laughs> um, I don't know. It's hard to say because it's such an emotional thing yeah. that, that I'm feeling, right? So it's not, it, you can't quantify it. You can't say that all we need to do is just do X or Y 
and that'll fix it. It's just kind of like, that's not, that's not it. You know, that's not it. I don't know what to do. Sing it again. Play it again. You know, try. I mean, like Charlie Brown's Parents, which was on the Dishwalla's very first album, Pet Your Friends. That song, the demo for that song is probably why we got signed. Because the mm. demo to that song on that cheap old cassette yeah. tape that we had done was so good. But I mean, it's it sounds, you know, like a garage band, you know, it doesn't really, sonically doesn't sound that great, but there's something really exciting about it when you hear it. So we went to go record it. And so we were thinking, oh, this is going to be, it's going to be amazing. Because imagine what that song will sound like recorded yes. well with a producer and blah, 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 all this stuff. But we recorded it and sonically it sounds really good, but there's something wasn't quite right. So we ended up so much so that we decided to go and try recording it again. So we went to a different place with a different person and tried to record it again. Still wasn't ever quite there. Doesn't have the same magic as the... So what's on, what's on the Better Friends album? Is the version that's really good, but not as good, doesn't have the magic that our demo has. Isn't that album celebrating its what? How many years now? 20? Uh, 28. 28, 28 years, right? 28 years, yeah. Better Friends. Counting blue cars. You, you, I'm getting old. What's yeah, going on? Oh my God. <laughs> Woo! Ca counting blue cars. You wrote that song. Yeah. yeah. I really want, really like to meet her. Mm. Yeah. How did that lyric? We talked about this on the virtual, but yeah. to the to a wider audience, when you were when when you were, when you were writing the lyrics to to the song, what were you expecting? Were you expecting people to go ah? This is, people are going to talk about this, or you know, I didn't think about that at, at all. It didn't even cross my mind once. It was one of those things where I was writing this song about this kid's kind of, I guess, spiritual journey. <laughs> where he's trying to figure out what, what, you know, how, why are we here? What is, what is this thing, life, and get a better understanding. And you know, he's going from in my mind, going from one side of town to the <laughs> other, right? You know, um, and then I flipped the pronoun, which yeah. you know, right now in the states, especially a big pronoun thing going right. on, right? Right. Um, and you know, I was like, okay, cool next. And went on to the next song and really didn't think about th it that much. And then it was one of those things. It was about, oh, Charlie Brown's parents is going to be our first single. Yes. Right. And then that just didn't really translate. So it ended up being counting blue cars. It but you never, you never, counting blue cars was never part of, was never meant to be the first, uh, no, to be the no. hit single. In my mind, that was not a single. So I, I'm not, a, I shouldn't be the person picking singles apparently because that song was huge. But I mean, in my mind, I was like, well, it's a, you know, it's good, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it sounds okay. It's a good song. And because um, originally we had another song called Haze that was on the album that was our first single, but it didn't translate very well. So the, the label decided to pull it really quickly mm. and pretend it never happened. And then and then decided to release Counting Blue Cars. And a lot of people, the label felt like this is a great song with like a duo. Did they meet with you when they said, did they actually sit you guys down and say, and said, uh, we're releasing Counting Blue Cars or they just did it on their own? And Well, yeah, there were, th there were <clears throat> three camp, there were three different camps, groups of people in the label that one wanted to release, you know, one group of people wanted to release Charlie Brown's Parents, mm -hmm. one Hayes and one Counting Blue Cars. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the Hayes group won first. They didn't do very well. Then they decided to go with County Blue Cars. I mean, a lot of the, we were on tour, so a lot of this was kind of out of our control. Right, right. And and to be honest, I wouldn't have wanted to make that decision. I was yes. so young and really didn't have any. So okay, idea. so you were on tour. Hayes was out. Yeah, that that wasn't really um, creating much of a dent like Counting Blue Cars did, right? Yeah. So you were on tour. Yeah. Who are you touring with at this point? I think we were touring with... Uh, was this a Matchbox 20 tour night? No, yet? no. It was a, I think it was Better Than Ezra. Better Than Ezra. Yeah. Mm, they were good. So yeah, they, 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 <laughs> no, they're a good, good band, man. They are good band. You got <laughs> like <a> sh <laughs> The single, right? Good. So anyway... Yeah, so it was good. <laughs> so, it was really good. What was your single? It was, it was good. Yeah, yeah. It was okay. No, it was actually good. <laughs> yeah. So, shout out to the guys from Better Than Ezra. Uh, yeah, Kevin, I so. love them. I, I digress, right? But yeah, my guys. first my first Pentium was the IBM Aptiva. And I'd go to the good guys. And they were all over the demo. For oh, the, were they? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so cool. Because it was good. That was uh, the, yeah. the demo of the IBM Aptiva. Right, yeah, but which that was, makes sense, yeah. I digress. But yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. You guys were on tour with Better Than Ezra. Yeah. Finally, in 96, Counting Blue Cars come out, comes out. Mm -hmm. Was it 96 or 95? They 95? released it in 95. 95. But it really didn't start taking off till 96. And, and you guys were on tour. We were on tour, yeah. 
So did you notice the sudden influx of fans because of this? Because this, well, you know, it's interesting. I, you didn't really notice it as much because we were always opening up for someone. Ah. So if there were more people at the at the show, I just attributed that to being the. Yep, they're come to see the other band. I'm like, wow, they're better than other guys. They're doing great, you know. Um, I, you know, so because we were, you know, we'd be playing with the Goo Goo Dolls or right. Tonic or, you know, Cheryl Crow, we were on tour with quite a bit. So you, you just, you just, we were always opening up for them. So I never really thought, you know, if the room was full, it it's probably wasn't us. It was probably them. But when did you probably. feel that it was you guys? Um, I, uh, that's a good question. I think that maybe when we did, um, we won a Billboard Award in '96. And uh, we were, well, we were asked to be on the show because we were nominated for Rock Song of the Year. Yeah. Which was like, it took yeah. me a second for it to sink in. And the people at the label are like, you have no idea. This is a big deal. Yeah, you know? big deal. I mean, the fact that you're nominated is like, you're on the radar. This is really good. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And um, it wasn't until I walked out on the stage <laughs> to play in front of, you know, 28, 30 million people live. And it's like, the front row is like, sting. You know, oh. uh, Mariah Carey. You know, it's like, uh, um, Santana. It, I mean, it was it was no, that, that was your pitch me moment. This is the front row. <laughs> LL Cool J, and it was like, are you kidding me? So yeah. Alan Grimmyer, so yeah. I just gave you front row. So I, you know, I remember uh, being like, this is weird because I'm used to seeing those yeah. shows, yeah. and and you know, the cameras will pan around to the front to the you know the the front yes. rows, and you'll see all those people sitting there. But then I'm standing on the stage looking at them from that same perspective. How did it, it feel? Just, it was scary at first. But then, but, and luckily just kind of, you know, the song started and we kicked in and we just started playing and, um, you know, and it sounded good. It's interesting because that night, you know, there, there were probably 30 different artists that were performing at the Billboard Awards, right, during the night. Only two of them actually played live. Everybody else was lip syncing. Lip -syncing. Yeah, so we played live. Um, even though our label was begging us to just, hey, well, perhaps you should just, just not take a chance of sounding crap that night. And, you know, because that can kill your career. Yes. Just go out and lip sync, you know. And we were like, no, 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 no. We, we play live every night, you know. We'll, we'll go ahead and play. And then Brooks and Dunn, the, the country artists, they, they actually, they were awesome too. They sounded amazing. But everybody else was out lip syncing. Wow. Yeah. So these opportunities... Did you, we were talking about visualization a while ago mm -hmm. while having dinner. Yeah. As a kid, did you visualize everything that happened to your music career or was it by chance? Um, that's a good question. Probably more vis visualization. It's hard to say. Um, just because that's all I've ever really thought about as a, even as a kid. I mean, before I could speak, I was singing. Yes. Because everybody in my family sang and, you know, played an instrument and, that's just what I was used to. That's just what you did to communicate. And so, um, but you, you know. but you, you actually took it to a different level. Yeah. Yeah. And among everyone in your family. Yeah. I mean, for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, cause, um, I, I don't, I don't know why I just, you know, I, I was probably nine when I started writing songs, you know, but what, is it, what did they say when, when you started doing this, when they saw that you have siblings, right? Yeah, I have, I have one, one sister, but one I had, sister, okay. I, but it was a lot of uncles and yeah. aunts, and they all, you know, weren't too much younger than me or too much older than me, and they all played and sang and were in bands and. Um, but never, I want a record deal. Never, never that. No, right? no, no. And I wasn't really thinking about that either. Really? I just, wow. I just enjoyed playing anything that I, any time I could play, any opportunity, any instrument I could learn how to play. I was all over that. I mean, even learning how to be a, an engineer right. or a producer, any, anything I could do, I, was, I wanted to be a part of it. Or just go and sit on the side of the stage and watch. I'll help you set up your drum kit, you know? I'm in. I still enjoy doing that, you know, those yeah, kinds of things. Is, this is, the, goosebumps, this is so surreal because you're a rock star <laughs> without the rock star attitude. It's <laughs> very inspiring. If people watching can, can, can feel you, your presence now, it's big, it's very impactful at the same time it's a lesson that all all of us here in this room should pick up on that you're this generous human being putting out you know something that hopefully will reverberate to everybody watching and and i just wanted to say that to you oh, personally. Wow, well, gosh, that's really kind of you thank you because now 
Now, when when you when you set out to do this, you as an artist, was it already Dishwala or was it supposed to be solo or it did not matter at that point in your life journey? Yeah, like early on. This episode is brought to you by Leo Bato and Associates, ang realtor na pato. Yeah, it was just um, well. Even though I was writing songs and I would be singing, I was never considered myself a singer. Really? Uh, yeah, I just considered myself more of, of a musician, and I just loved doing stuff. And it wasn't about trying to be the best guitar player or piano player or whatever instrument. Um, it was just about being a part of it, you know, and being somebody who's making this beautiful sound, you know. That yeah, because you know, I love listening to music, and I, and I love anyway. So. Um, and it's it just kind of evolved in a in a weird way. So you started solo. Yes, yeah, so I started started kind of solo. I played with a lot of bands. I was always a keyboard player though. <laughs> I don't know why. That was I mean I started playing piano when I was four or five. So and I had quite a few synthesizers that I would save up for and those kind of things. So I really enjoyed that part. And I never thought about being a singer until because uh, I was a keyboard player in this band, and um, the singer was who was and had an excellent voice um he kept getting roles in like broadway plays and things like ah. that and so he was never at rehearsal and so and, and so we were like well how are we going to rehearse well I, I can sing the songs i mean i know the words and i'll just put the mic on and i'll play my keys i got my little headphone yes. set so i would just sing in rehearsal um so we could practice and then he would show up at the gigs when we would play and then uh, one night he just called and said Sorry guys, I just got another role and I got I can't make it. And we we were con, you know I was I was only sixteen or something like that. We 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 had a contract that we had to play this this place all weekend. And uh, so the guys are like, looks like you're singing tonight. So I took my, I was like terrified, but I, <laughs> I pushed my keyboards up onto the edge of the stage, right? And I had my little headset on so I could play and sing at the same time. And you know I'm out front and that. Were you covering position. or were these original songs? Uh, mostly covers, I think. Yeah. yeah, probably at this point. And, um, but that's, anyway, anyway, from that point on, I became the lead singer guy, you know? So. Now, when, when you became the lead singer guy, was it in, was it with reluctance or did you embrace it a hundred percent? Um, well, cause I think every night there would, uh, like in the band, every band I was in, I might sing one song and I would walk up to the front of the mic, not playing right. an instrument and just sing. And right. I loved it. I just, you know, would take on whatever the song was and be the character and, and just, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm like, let's do this. this is all. I loved it. Loved it. But I never thought of myself as a lead singer. Right. So it was just this moment to go and just have a bit of fun and, like, <laughs> and then go back and hide behind the keyboards. Right. Um, which was fine with me, you know? So yeah, I was a little reluctant, I think, to just because I, I know it, because that's a lot of energy to, for just to do one song yeah. was, I'd be exhausted because it's like you're trying to connect with the whole room and all the focus is on the singer typically, yes. right? Because you're the one, you know, yes. you're using your, you know, our voices anyway. So um, yeah, it's a lot of extra responsibility that comes with being a singer in a band. Then. Let's let's uh, let's drill down with yeah. regard to that because people only see the singer as you know the billboard of the whole band. But mm. like um, to set up the question in this this the scene, like I'm a drummer, mm. I I sing one two songs in the band. I can talk all night long and not worry because even if I lose my voice, I can still sing the song I'm assigned to sing. Right, right. And play the drums. Not in your case though. Your voice is your instrument. Yeah. You got to take care of that. Yeah. Like we were talking about Arnell, we couldn't talk to him because he has a show tomorrow, yeah. has to sleep early. When it dawned on you that you said one song, two songs, exhausting, having to connect with the audience with one or two songs, exhausting. Just the thought of now having to do it full time mm -hmm. with your voice, which actually became the signature sound of the band. Right, right. What was the pressure like to would be wannabe singers out there? Yeah, it's it's huge. I mean, I recommend to any, anyone who's who's sings and wants to be that lead singer thing is to really take care of that voice. I mean, I started studying opera technique, um, and this is a long time ago. But so when I was about eighteen, I, I I just happened to be very lucky and started studying under this guy, Ron Anderson, who is. Probably until he passed a couple of years ago, probably like the number one vocal teacher in the world. Right. You know, I mean, um, uh, and it changed my whole, the whole way I look at singing and, you know, beyond just 
having, you know, improving your voice and taking care of it, but just the whole idea of what it's like to be that person that, because you have to think about it. It's like you're, you're putting on a show. To, to that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very big sentence. Of you're putting on a show. Right. And, and sorry to cut you short. No, because no, other sorry. people think that the person in the kitchen or at home or in the bedroom is the same person up on stage. I keep telling people those are two different yeah. people. Yeah, it's okay. it's. I mean, for me, it's a part of me. Yes, but it's not all of me. No, you know? no, and no, no. And it's like because you, you can't if you're stressed or you're sad. That has to. Or those you have to leave that off the yeah. stage and walk out there, and because people expect to hear and see what they see on you know right. YouTube or here on Spotify or whatever it might be. So you you have to you know. So you're playing. You're, so you're putting on a show. Yeah, you're putting then. on a show. I mean, you, you know, and and it's you're there too because people, especially too, if you're if you're people pay to come see you play. Um, you know, they, they want to be entertained. So it's just kind of part of, of, of your job really in that way. And it does sometimes feel like a job. So it's finding that balance of, of enjoying what you're doing and kind of crafting who you are when you're, when you are being your lead singer personality. Um, and, but also treating it seriously, you know, and taking it very, very seriously and, and trying, you know, trying to so that people leave and they feel happy, you know, I mean, it's, that's what it's all about is that right. really connecting. And also, you know, trying to, to remember that this is music we're singing. It's supposed to be fun, right? It's supposed to be enjoyable. That's why I started doing it to begin with. And so it's reminding myself that, because I know a lot of singers are complaining because they got I'm really tired or, oh, do I have to go out tonight and sing in front of 50,000 people? It's like, are you kidding me? Exactly. Right. You really so many people would kill to be in that position. Yeah. So it's like, you know, always not losing that perspective of how fortunate we are to be in a position to go. And even if it's 10 people in that room, that's awesome. You know? And it's like you, you go out and you do the best you can, whether it's 10 or 10,000, it just, it shouldn't matter. It's just, you know, doing it because you enjoy it. That's really what it's all about. That's what I tell every every artist that I work with that's young is don't do it because you want to be famous or you want to make a lot of money right. or you know whatever it is do it because you would do it whether anybody was listening or not because you're doing it for yourself you know you really and and that's how you're going to make the best music too Now when you start to do <laughs> when you started when you started out on your journey yeah applying what you just told us now you're the lead vocalist. You're probably what, 17, 18 at this yeah. time? Yes. I'd be about right, yeah. When did it become real to you that, oh my God, this is going to be my life? Oh gosh, probably not until, it didn't seem feasible because I was still going to school, college right. and, and- This is Santa Barbara. This right? is Santa Barbara, yeah. So um, I was still going to school. I mean, that was one thing my parents said. They're like, we totally, we love that you love music and you're doing this and and we support that 100% but just please keep going to school, you know, have, have a plan B, right. Right. You know, and, and then we'll continue to support it. So, um, did you have a plan B? Uh, well, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, I, cause I was, you know, in school, it was like, I, I was a music major, but I was also, um, minoring in German, which is kind of weird. Really? Yeah. Cause I've been to Germany quite a few times now. The Germans <laughs> speak English better than Americans do. <laughs> so I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> It's an absolutely useless thing to, to learn in school. So, um, I mean, my English was being corrected at the, at, at the McDonald's in Germany. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> you know, anyway, so, so that was been a really horrible plan B, right? So um, but luckily the music thing worked out. But I think that what, so for me, it, it wasn't until we probably got signed and, and it, you know, and you're signing contracts and you have a lawyer and, and uh, you know, all this, it became like, whoa, this is really for real. And, 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 and then you felt this weight of responsibility now because they're spending money on you and you owe them a lot of money and you better be good. Otherwise right. they're going to, you know, you're, you're, you're done. So that's what people don't understand. We owe the label a lot of money. They think they're giving us, people think that they're giving us money. No, they're advancing. Yeah money that hasn't been made by us for yeah. them you're exactly right and even as the artist you forget that because i i mean we would go to these very expensive dinners and i'm thanking them all you're not and, supposed and, to. <laughs> and in their minds they're like you're paying for it so right? i don't know why you're thanking us you know we're you're buying me dinner and you know they're, they're ordering these fancy bottles of wine and think i'm like wow this is a thank you they're like no thank you 
<laughs> so we're still not recouped because <laughs> of, all those, of all those dinners. We've sold millions of albums and we've never seen a penny. Yeah, so it's, it, 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 you're right. It's right? like you, you forget that um, they're, they're loaning you all this money. And they're also the ones that decide when you've recouped. Which yes. is really bad position to be because there's no check or balance. There's nobody leaning over saying, why are you charging them 10 times for that dinner mm -hmm. at one dinner? And it's like, you know. Just but, to have them open the books, that's, you got to yeah, get a lawyer for that. Exactly, exactly. Oh so it's, it gets really, really dodgy. So, um, yeah, that's that's the, yeah, being with the label is tricky. Now, with regard to that, when when you guys signed up as Dishwala with the, with the label, yeah, how did that... Um, uh, how did that affect your relationship among each other? You being the lead vocalist, you not really having to. Um, I get it because, like with our with our lead vocalist Jonathan, mm -hmm. it's not that he doesn't want to do it. It's just that with regard to the responsibility, it's his face in front of all those people. Right, right. And and like in your case, like I asked you a while ago, when did it get real? You said when we when you signed up. With the label now you're going out on tour mm -hmm. now there are you're not playing once a week you're playing almost every yeah, day yeah what what I, changed? I think too well what changes dramatically i think because if you are the singer and that, i mean take me personally out of the equation but if you're the singer or you're the songwriter um you know uh the res the responsibility the amount of responsibility is not equal yes you know i mean that's what i found out initially because right away they were like okay you know you're you're the singer and we want to go try to break europe or break you know scandinavia or something so they would send me and maybe rodney the guitar player yeah. out and we would go do a radio tour and you know the other guys are like cool i'm just gonna hang out at home you know go on vacation go skiing whatever um you know while we're out there working and then the band would come back as a full band and do right. that you know and at the same time you know and then being the main songwriter too i'm also responsible for that so anytime we weren't on tour or recording i was trying to write the next mm -hmm. album so that it just was non non-stop so it's uh you know because we were always when we went into it we we're you know we're just a bunch of friends right right very simple young guys no you know we have no responsibility really other than to ourselves i guess and all of a sudden we get all this extra responsibility thrown on us because now they're you know this expectations yes you know and uh and then even though we were very much like, you know, everything's very equal. We shared all the money equally, and, you know, very all for one, one for all, but the responsibility was not equal. So that, that definitely made things kind of complicated, tri tricky yeah, for yeah. me. You know, I know for me after, you know, by our fourth or fifth album, I was just exhausted because the workload was just, was just a lot more, you know, I have to do more interviews. I have to do more of the radio tours, more of that kind of stuff. And then the responsibility of writing was now, mostly on me. When did when did it take its toll with regard to you know what I'm exhausted I'm tired I need a break when did those things happen to you? Uh, I mean, for me, it happened early on. I think in and around after our first album, I was pretty exhausted. Well, after um, your first album in your head, you were like, "Wait a minute!" But you never said anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, and, and I there's a lot of pressure too because you just had a hit album. Mm. They're expecting you to write another hit album, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's this, a lot of pressure. Smallville opened the doors to more of the '90s uh, bands, in my opinion. Like, like, yeah. Like, yeah. like you guys when 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 Opalin was featured on, on um, the songs from Opalin was featured on Smallville. Right, right. Was that was that a good thing for you guys or a bad thing? No, for no, no, great, great thing. Because that's, I mean, that's especially too if you're trying to break into markets that are outside of the U.S. Cause yes, it's. Because I, mean, I was in the Philippines when I heard that. Oh, that's uh, that's awesome. Well, you know, so many countries. Smallville's a big show yeah. and like we weren't we weren't actively trying to break ourselves in the Philippines or South America right, or right, all right. these other places our focus because the the idea has always been that if you can break a band in the U.S. then you, then the rest of the world will be easy well it's not actually it's the other way around yeah actually. yeah it, exactly you you know um I mean yeah because I know for a fact it's, <laughs> it doesn't actually work like that I know probably it has with some bands but for us it, it wasn't that way but because of shows like Smallville, yeah, Smallville. or Charmed yes. or like the American Pie uh -huh. the movie and quite a few other things that we've done had songs on and those shows ended up having such a big cult Go following, following. that, um, it, it, yeah, you're like, whoa, because I, I got a call, you know, a couple of years ago to go play down in Latin America, right? And they wanted me to come to Peru and 
And you're like, what? First shows in Lima, and I'm kind of like, are you sure you got the right guy? <laughs> you know, and, it, and they were actually, you know, paying me well enough to go down and actually yes. do that. But the whole time I'm thinking, they've definitely got me mixed up with somebody else, you know. And, uh, I, you know, all, so much so that even though I went there early before the band had landed um, to do a bunch of promo. And so I was on all these TV shows and everything in Lima. And uh, I started to realize, like, these people actually know who I am. You know, they, they know all this Dishwalla history. They even know some of my solo stuff. I'm like, this is crazy. How do they know this? Smallville. It was mostly from Smallville. So Angels of Devils, for example, yeah. was a massive hit in Somewhere Lima. In the and uh, Collide, Collide was in Smallville as well. Mm -hmm. Big. So because of that, um, those that particular country, for example, is not driven so corporately so people could actually be like i heard this song by a band called dish Walla. can you play it and they will yes it's not like here if you call there they're like oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no. yeah we'll get to that and then of course i never play it you know um but it, there they did so um yeah we had this massive cult following there and even though it's their it's not their first language as soon as i hit the first chord of, yep. of uh angel of devils the whole place i'll show you the video yeah <laughs> the, the bass player and i because i start the song when i play it I, I sit down on the piano and i start uh. playing it and the band kicks in on the second verse and um so it's you know this very intimate moment and uh, you know this is the last time right and and then there's 5,000 people singing it with me. And I was, had to pause for a second. I was like, what's going on? And it was crazy. So our bass player, um, wow. he, he started filming this moment happening. And I mean, I was just sitting there with tears coming out of my eyes. It was, I couldn't even hear myself. I was singing off key horribly probably because the audience was so Isn't loud. that very humbling? When, when, oh my like, God. Stuff like it that was happened. one of the most, I mean, it's so unexpected. Because I honestly, I remember landing in Lima thinking, wrong guy <laughs> nobody's gonna show up to see us play and and i'm gonna feel it because the promoter is this lovely lovely guy and he spent all this time and money to put the show together he's got me down there and i'm still thinking that he's you know got he's not has not figured this out and it was packed it was sold out it was amazing so yeah it just very very unexpected beautiful moments that happen sometimes i uh, i first reached out to you nine years ago via twitter yeah that's right and um it was amazing. I, I never expected you to reply. And I was like, oh my God, he replied. I was telling Janelle, we were talking about it before you came. And Janelle's like, remember how you, how you were jumping up and down when JR replied to your Twitter <laughs> message? I'm like, yeah. And then, and then you and my good friend Mark Tupas worked yeah. together. You mentored yeah. him on a song. Uh, this, this big heart of yours, you know, is it because you just like doing this or what's what's the deal? What's what's up with the not so rock star attitude? <laughs> you said a while ago you consider yourself a musician, but yeah. considering yourself a musician and having a taste of stardom, why did it not change you? Or did it did well, it change you? I mean, I'm sure it probably did, you know. I mean and hopefully I wasn't didn't go through a period where I was too annoying. But I mean I, I think that you know, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I've, a lot of it had to do with my singing teacher, I think, because he was very, Ron was very... Um, Ron's the opera guy? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, uh, um, like the first day that I went in to to take a lesson with him, just to kind of give you an example yeah, of the please. caliber he was at, I could hear him, I'm, you know, he's in his conservatory and, and he has, you know, somebody answer the door and they sit me down in this hallway and I'm listening, I can hear through the door, he's working with somebody. And I'm like, God, I recognize that voice, you know? Oh. And, uh, and then I, he, ha he had a British accent. I was like, how the heck is that? And it was Seal. Ooh. Yeah. And so this huge black man, good looking Ooh. black man comes rolling out. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Seal. And he's like, hey, hey, mate. You know? And so I'm like, hey, wow. Okay. So, but that's, you know, um, but Ron is one of those guys. He's, he's more than just a vocal coach. He just knows you as a, as a human being and he's really good and has always been really good at just kind of keeping you grounded. Um, so, and also understanding that, you know, this is serious. You have to take care of your voice. If you start going out and partying and doing stuff, I'm going to know and you, you're out yeah, and you're out, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to teach you anymore. So, you know, I basically live like a priest but I th it's very humbling to, you know, you realize that if I want to go out and sing well every night, I really do have to, to really keep my, you know, my act together. You know, it's, imp and, and I was brought up to always make sure you're kind to right. everyone, to who, everybody there is equally important. Um, 
you know, and I'm happy to go in. I still enjoy setting up my own stuff. You know, I love rehearsing. You know, I love the work that's involved in all of it. This episode is brought to you by Dr. Lourdes Capolong. Right. Um, I mean, I get huge joy out of that. So, um, yeah, you know, so I it mean, just, just works out. I mean, I, and I, I don't, I think lead singers get, get a bad rap rap for that. You know, they're being lazy and don't know anything about anything. And they're never, you know, I was the guy setting the PA system up. <laughs> Usually it's the lead singers just rolls into the cigarette and it's like, <laughs> we ready to go? You know, with a couple chicks, you know, whatever. And it's that, that was, I was not that guy. So probably kind of boring, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, cause yeah. Cause like, like when, when Mike saw your show in Santa Clarita, yeah. I was like, did JR even say hi? Yeah. He was even shocked that I was taller than him. Yeah. <laughs> and all that stuff. And Dude, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> I was on my toes when we were taking photos. <laughs> So moving to, okay, moving to England. Yeah. So why, why, did, why did men not move to the States? Why was it the other way around? Well, men was already living. We met here in California. So um, initially, so, um, and we were living here for quite a while. I mean, we were married in Scotland, but we uh, lived in California for years. Um, and, uh, but when I was telling you, one of our boys yeah, is, is highly boys, special yes. needs and, uh, he became so ill, um, that, uh, we needed to find a place somewhere that would, he would, you know, help him, you know, cause he was, it was not, he was doing very poorly. So, um, it, it just turns out we found there was a hospital, very forward thinking hospital in Oxford, mm -hmm. England. He's a UK citizen, right? His mom's British. So he qualifies, but, but the thing with the UK is even though healthcare is free, which is mind blowing <laughs> how awesome that is. Cause the healthcare is amazing there uh, and it's free. free. It's <laughs> like, are you joking? I mean, if you're, if you're not a student and you go and you get, you know, like we had, one of our boys is a type one diabetic, right? He, okay. I mean, he probably pays, you know, we have to pay like a thousand dollars a month for insulin for hair. Right. Right. Which, just so happens it looks like that might change that recent uh, soon but i hope so but that's how it has been historically i mean he was just you know at eight he was diagnosed not his fault it's not the way he eats or anything like that it's just the way he was ate. it your fault or no well i hope not <laughs> um but um yeah and you know so when he's in the uk he pays nothing for his insulin wow because he's there but he's going to school in florida right now or he's living in florida and and you know how old's your son um they range we have four boys okay. so they range from 20 22 to 33 you have a you have a 33 year old right. yes i do Dang. i know crazy huh so no grandkids yet no no <laughs> i know i'm like what's up i'm starting to think it's just never gonna happen I'm like what's up you guys get on with it but no okay. I, they're all, yeah they're they're all lovely and and uh but but one of them is is yes. highly, highly special needs and so he was and he was really quite ill so um men had found a hospital uh and she, I mean, men's amazing i mean it, the, what she went through to to, to, to care right, for him. Right. It's just been a mind blowing and she's sacrificed basically everything in order to make sure her you know, kids are okay. But, um, we found this hospital, but the only thing is you have to live, you have to be there. in the catch, you have to be in the catchment area. You gotta be right next. So we found a house online, a little townhouse, um, that was, you know, within a stone's throw distance to the hospital and we've never set foot in it. We just rented it and sold and gave everything away and up and left. Um, you know, um, that was eight years ago. How are you? How am I? Yeah. Oh, I'm great. I'm so, great. Yeah. So you put family first. Yeah. And I ask you how you are and you are great. Expound on that and explain that to people who put the, who put everything else first before family. What, is it your upbringing that, that made you go, hey, no questions asked, family comes first? Yeah, yeah, without I mean, question, of course, yeah. Where did that principle come from? Because nowadays everybody's so career-driven, me, yeah. me, me, me. Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes in order to be successful, you have to sacrifice everything else, yes. right? And, and, that, and, and I know that because I, I look at people that even are my contemporaries and the ones that are doing, typically the ones that do really well, it's because it's, that's all they do. And I unfortunately can't put that same kind of time and energy into it because I, you know, I'm a husband, I'm a father, you know, 
I have dogs and cats. I I'm have having a care. bad crush. <laughs> so, you know, and that stuff is more important. Right. I mean, clearly, without a question. And music is important to me too, but I can do that anywhere. Um, I mean, obviously, there, you know, I have to be conscious because I, you know, I have to make sure I, you know, we can keep the lights on. Yes. And, you yes. know, and, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those, I'm not wealthy by any means. And, and, but that's not, I've never been what it's been, in, you know, why I've ever done it. I would have quit long ago. You know, it's never been about the money, but the enjoyment of being able to do it. But of course, you know, having kids and family that, that's, that supersedes everything else. And so without, you know, and men's the same way. So we both dropped everything and, and just said, we'll, we'll figure it out and, it, and saved his life. So he's, he's doing really, really well now. And so we're kind of like things are stable so we sh we're just gonna you know continue. and you know what Stay stability is a blessing yes that's a lot to be grateful for it is to have stability it is. yeah are there regrets though um not really because i think i mean i've made some bad choices in my life but um but i wouldn't be where i am now if i change those i might mess with that right you know it's it's that whole like very you know science fiction kind of thing where if you could get in a time machine and go back and change some of the things that you did, you end up screwing up some of the the good things, uh, yeah. right? And so you know you risk that, and and even though it's been a tough journey to get where I am, that have had that have had so many beautiful moments on the way, but I love where I'm at. You know, I don't think I would ever would have met men if I didn't go through the things that I had gone through, right, right. to get there. So. I would risk losing her if I were to go back and regret and want to change those things. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Yeah, a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Um, getting back with the guys at, uh, in Deshwala. Remotely possible, <laughs> not possible? I don't know. I mean, anything is possible. It's it's tough, man. I, I think, um, you know, we've been through a lot together. There have also been a lot of guys in the band. I mean, right. we've had, you know, we've had two drummers. We've had three keyboard players. We've had like five bass players um, and now two singers, right? So... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a lot of different configurations. Yes. Um, and but if the original lineup decides to do a show, let's say, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> like a one night only. Yeah. I mean, they're pretty happy with where they are and, right. and, um, Justin who's singing with them now is great and it sounds good. They've, they've been putting out some really good music. I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, they, they don't sound like Dishwalla to me because of course, you're the voice. It, well, I mean, in my head, I'm yeah. the voice. I'm sure to other people, it doesn't matter. And that's that's totally fine. So I just say that purely out of my own, you know, just right. my own perspective. But um, but all lovely guys, all amazing musicians. Um, but it, it's hard when you're in a band for a long period of time. It's, I mean, as you know, you, yeah. you, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's like being married to, you know, four or five other people. Yes. And there's no sex. So which yes. is really tough. But no, it's you know what I mean? It's it's a it's that kind of emotional commitment. Yes. And and it goes a lot of different directions. And it's and and then, you know, we started when we were kids. Kids. And then all of a sudden we're adults and we're married and we, we have kids and our responsibilities and our points of view change. And um yeah, I just got to a point well, I mean the band did did break up after our fifth album. And I just kept on going, you know, I mean, I, I, I went straight in. I mean, I think maybe I took a year or two kind of where I wasn't quite sure what I was doing, but I kept writing songs. Yeah. And so then I took those songs and wrote my first solo album. And, and then it was around that time where some of the original members got back together and said, Hey, let's start playing again. And I was like, well, I'm kind of right in the middle of doing this other thing. And, and, uh, you know, they didn't want to wait around, which was fine. So they, they, uh, they just continued on. But okay. like, like, um, tell me when to stop. Huh? <laughs> like, tell me when to stop. I'll, I'll just keep asking. Mm -hmm. when, when you're in the middle of a, a solo album and they want to get together after them taking a hiatus and you waiting for them, is the conversation simple? Is it tricky? Does it have to be honest? Or is it kind of stoic where you're in there? Eh? <laughs> and, the, and the reason why I'm asking those questions is because like any other relationship communication yeah. is key right and oh, like yeah. you mentioned like um, you guys grew up together me and JJ same band 36 years we know how it is and um, it hurts sometimes if you if you guys don't get along but what, what right. what's the conversation like I mean is it calm is it give and take are there compromises well i mean you know we have a, i mean for the most part as a band we got along really well um which is probably why we lasted as long as we did while i was in the band you know but 
uh, I mean, we had a share of, you know, a couple of fist fights along the way and, also- you know, and, and, and plenty of yelling and screaming moments, but, um, that's you know, part of it though, and, and I, I think that's, that is part of it. And hopefully you can work through that kind of stuff, but, um, but you, you do have to be honest, but it is tough. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily get along well enough with some of the guys in the band. Ever yeah. since? It is, or now, just well, I think that when, when it came around to, okay, we're going to get back and going again. Of course, a lot of ch- some choices were made and I wasn't even a part of it. And it was just like, this right. is what we're doing. And I was like, well, hang on. I haven't left the band. Right. And, but nobody asked me if I'm okay with this. All of a sudden it's like, what the heck? So it just, I had to be really honest with myself. I I've obviously felt very obligated to these guys because I love them all. Yeah. Right. And I don't want to disappoint them. And I know, and, and separate from me personally, just because I am the lead singer, that's a, it's a hard thing to, to, yeah. to replace. Right. Cause we've, we've, we've gone through, we've flipped drummers, we've flipped bass players, we've, we've flipped keyboard players. We've done, nobody really notices those changes and, and no disrespect to anyone. It, 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 it just, just has yeah. to, you know I mean? It's just, it's just life. And I mean, cause it, I, yes. could, I could have been the bongo player in the yeah. band and, and they could have been a different bongo player one night and nobody would have known. Right. I could have been the best boggle player on the planet. It had nothing to do with that. I totally so, agree. You know what I get? So it's just weird how it works. And, and also being the main songwriter too, that means that that's also gone away as well right. too. So um, I know that if I leave the band or if I don't play with them in this configuration that they want to do, then that makes it difficult for them. So it, I had to, I struggled with that big time. But what ended up being a thing is that they decided they wanted to go and play and do X shows, but I had already committed myself to to recording right, and the right. schedule. And it was like, I literally was like, no, you, you got to stay on course, man. This is what you're doing, you know, and love them or not. You, you, you know, you got to do what you need to do for yourself to be happy, you know, and you, not, do and not, the, you, you cannot way. compromise yourself in that way, because I know it, would, it wouldn't have been a healthy situation. I, it would have ended up going bad eventually if I had acquiesced and said, all right, I'll do whatever you guys want to do. But would you write for Dishwala? Yeah, sure. I would love to play with those guys. Mm. I mean, I enjoy that. I, we make great music together. Whether it's a song we write as a band or one of, because a couple of the other guys in the band are amazing songwriters. Right. Um, and, you know, Dishwalla has a thing that when, you know, and, and it's interesting because different configurations that we have been, right? Um, and, uh, but each configuration was brilliant. You know, and you, so I would bring in a song and it would yeah. generally come out sounding better than what I brought in, you know, <gasps> just because you put it through that lens of, of how everybody does everything. And it's like, wow, there, now there's some magic. So, um, I love that. I love that. I miss that. There's no, no doubt about that. I mean, I, you know, I was watching us playing, uh, somebody had sent me a film of us playing at a big radio show in Texas and I was enjoying <laughs> watching us play, you know? I was like, wow, that, you know, we were good. So doors are not closed. Well, I mean, I don't know how it would work. And, and the, the other thing too is, is that's rather unfair because there's a guy that's singing in the yes. band right now. Yes. Right. I mean, what if Steve Perry wanted to come back in and just say, you see Arnell? Yeah, yeah, and no, yeah, just push Arnell out. I'm, I'm in now I'm doing it. And <laughs> if that, Justin called you yeah, and invited you back, Well, I don't know why he would do that, but because uh, because <laughs> for I asked I asked Arnell the same question. I was yeah. like, "Would you call Steve just for the heck of yeah, just to watch the just to watch them play?" Yeah, I mean, because it it is it's a lot of egos and a lot of things that go on in there and stuff like that. And I don't want to create any issues right. with anyone. I'm happy. I'm happy doing my own thing. Right. I enjoy it, and I and I, I don't. I mean, I miss the, the, the joy of playing with those guys because I love playing with people yes. and those guys are amazing and we made incredible music together. I totally miss that. But, um, you know, it, it's, but it's, it, unfortunately life is a little more complex than that. And, and, um, so I don't know how that would ever work or if it could, but it's okay if it doesn't, you know, I'm absolutely fine with that because I am very happy doing my own thing and, um, and they seem like they're doing awesome. So and you know what that you're make, saying, that, and that makes me happy, and that that makes perfect sense. You know, and you're inspiring I, a lot of people, yeah. right? I mean, they still. they had a song. They just did a song. Um, they released like an EP, and one of the songs is it was charting, which is 
fucking awesome. That's you know, good. I was like, wow. For a moment, I was kind of hurt. <laughs> I was like, well, hey, I'm like, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I'm not singing. That. Um, but, but I'm like, but God, they sound awesome. So I'm like, well, okay, fair enough. You know, that, that they deserve that. And that, that's so cool to hear. And so that, that, that definitely, you know, I sat there and I'm like, oh, that actually makes me feel really, I'm really happy for them. That's so awesome of them. You know, well done. Now, right now, are you DIY or are you signed with the label? I'm completely 100% independent. Let's talk about that because yeah. that's that's a good route to go to go with, and I'm pretty sure songwriters and aspiring artists listening to this would love to hear from you, me, me included. Yeah. When you went um, fully independent, what are the things you anticipated? What are the things you forgot to anticipate that <laughs> slammed on your face that we have to be aware of? Right. Um, well, it, you know. I think w the only reason that I considered doing it 100% independent and like, okay, I'm a singer from a band. I'll write some songs, see if I can go get a deal, right? I'll go ah. see if I can sign with a label and, and do that whole thing. Um, just because my, my experience working with labels is that you give up so much, yes. right? I mean, it's not just money, it's just control and, and uh, I mean, it's really control. You know, I mean, a lot of decisions are going to be made without, Consulting you, you know, yeah, consorting you, and and there, and just a lot of control over, like, look, this is what we're doing, and if you have a problem with it, then goodbye, you know, bye, yeah. So, um, yeah, but and 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 I think if it were the '90s, I would have to do that, right? I mean, because in the '90s, if you wanted to release a song or an album, you had to sign with a major label because yes. otherwise, there was no other way to get your album onto a record shelf, you know, to sell to that guy in Munich, Germany, right to get onto that shelf there. Now with, you know, Apple and Spotify and all that, you know, it's, there is no, there are no shelves that have limited space. It's infinite now. Yes. So, so that, that, that is the biggest issue was, has always been distribution. Funny enough, that is the biggest thing. So when Napster happened, that destroyed uh, distribution, right? Yep. Because now you didn't, it wasn't about, are you going to be on, you know, cause I used to be a kid trying to talk the guy at the local record store to put my CD up on the counter. Whoa. And, but that would be the only place you could buy my album, right? There was no, there wasn't an internet, right? So there was no way to, to be able to go and download the album, you know, if you lived in Spain and yeah. you wanted it, right? So, um, so things have changed. So these days you can go out and you can have a presence worldwide. Right. You can record a song and, and people can in the Philippines can, yes. can buy it. Right. Yes. They can stream it. And they do, which is awesome. Yes. And I can do it all myself and I have control over it. Right. So that that's been a big part of it for me is just, you know, I, I'm much more in control of my own destiny. But then again, there's no advanced royalties no, anymore. There's not. That's a caveat that we have to be aware yes, of. Yes, it's true. But there are also now ways that you can market yourself. I mean, I have spent a lot, quite a few years now teaching myself internet marketing e-commerce with a real specific kind of weight as to being an actual artist yes. selling music and songs right so by um, the way uh, people yeah. are actually the the thing that people are looking at mm -hmm. right now is your qr code oh cool okay right? that's what they're seeing right, right now on the screen right so this is a, like <clears throat> this is an interesting thing about music so this qr code is going to take you to my patreon page right. which is my my compute community subscription right mm -hmm. and basically it's for people who enjoy hopefully are enjoying my music so much that they want to go deeper and know more about everything that goes into right. making those songs and and also like hey you know what are you doing during the day what what was it like being in the recording studio what was it like being on tour you know, what did your wife and you and your wife do on your, <laughs> on your honeymoon? That kind of thing. So even the Where vlog is on the Patreon. Yeah. I mean, it's all there. I mean, um, I'm actually going to start a podcast series. That's just, that's just going to be, maybe I can interview you. Yes. Yeah, that would be awesome. Oh. Um, I would love that. So, um, but it's going to be just for my Patreon community. Only, okay. Right. So it's going to be very, very small knit thing, but it's, you know, cause being, being an artist is much more than just singing some songs, yeah. right? I mean, I think that, you know, everybody has a story. Like, you're a very yes. interesting person. I, I could talk all day with you <laughs> like this, right? I, I love this. It's great. And I, Thank you. I, and I find, because I find it entertaining and interesting, yes. right? So um, I think that for artists, it's, it's about creating a whole culture yeah. about who you are. 
it's not, you know, so people have a better understanding of why you write the songs and, and why you sound the way you do and why you do the things that you do. Um, and, you know, and because, that's important. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, the why. Yeah, I mean, because think of all the artists and musicians that we grew up, we love. I loved knowing more about who they were as people. And why they did what they did. Exactly. You know, and, and, and I mean, I spend a lot of time, I do updates because I'm working on an album. So I'm constantly putting out updates right, and right. being in the studio or writing a song. I mean, even if it's just me trying to figure out a tuning uh -huh. on a guitar and I'll just put a camera on and be like, do you like this or do you like this better? You know, and as dumb as it sounds, my, my, my wife's like, really? You're, that's what you're sharing? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, I am. But this episode is brought to you by ABBA eServices. But for people really into it, they love that kind of yeah. access to, to see why you're, what, you know, your process of- Behind of, the scenes. Right, yes. that behind the scenes. So, and, and so my wife, Min, is, she's a sculptor, right? So she's, I mean, She's a director. She's done so many things. She's does she do now. clay? She does clay. She does. She does clay, and then she has like it. clay, pottery clay. Have, has she done no, that? No. She, um, she. Well, I think she has. It's not her thing. But she's, have you guys done ghost? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Although we should though, because I did cover. Uh, yeah, um, the, the Righteous Brothers. Yeah, I did. I did. Ah, uh, so you guys should do that whole oh, ghost. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. <laughs> I, I love the way you think, because I, I I did I did cover Unchained Melody because I did an album of of covers about ah. three or four years ago, and the first song on that album is Unchained Melody, and uh, so this is an okay, go, so, go, go. so this is an interesting thing. So along that line of like, okay, so you're an independent artist yes. and you're trying to get your music out there. So what did I do? I'm like, well, I just put this album out with covers. I'm like, what's the first song? Oh, well, it's Unchained Melody. Okay, cool. So then huh. film me singing and had filmed me singing in the studio recording. So we used a, a small clip of me singing um, uh, the chorus to the song or verse the chorus, whatever it was. And, um, and then I, so I had this clip and then I go to Facebook and I get into their ads manager, right? I mean, so we're going deep, right? Already we're in the ads manager in Facebook yeah. and I'm putting that video out and I'm marketing it to people who like, like uh, ballads. Uh-huh. Who like the movie Ghost, Ghost. right? Who, right? Okay. Patrick so, Swayze. Exactly. So you know, I'm thinking like, who who might enjoy this yes. song? Who's never heard of me before ever, right? Ah. And so it's it, that's what it's all about. It's going and finding your audience and then yes. bringing those people in and and having more than just playing some songs for them. It's really creating a culture around who you are as a person and sharing that with them, and you know, and giving them access so that they can you know, chat with yeah. you online or whatever it is. And, and, and so they, you know, they want to come see you play. They want to, you know, um, they want to download your music. They want to stream you on Spotify. And, 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 and then now next thing you know, you're, you're creating a career out of that. Yes. So how, how, okay. That being said, like you mentioned, men helping out with this, with this, how important is it to have your wife, your partner, your life partner with you all the way on your, on this journey? Oh, it's everything. Cause I, I, if she and I were stuck doing separate things that would, that would be tough. You know, one of us would have to probably acquiesce somehow yes. and, and in order to maintain a relationship, um, which is, you know, how it is sometimes. I mean, um, you have to make choices, but in this, in, in this case, men and I, like this Patreon page that the QR code was up, <laughs> men and I both do it. So, because we do so many things together and, um, and we're constantly kind of sharing our own, you know, we're helping each other different things. So all of her art, or she does all of my music. She's all the, most of the music videos I've yeah. done in the last 10, 12 we're years. We're shot by her? We're done by her. And they're the best ones I've ever done. <sighs> they're amazing. I mean, she's so brilliant. It's ridiculous. So, so, uh, so we do everything together. I mean, I mean, obviously there are days where I'm in the studio and there are days where she's, you know, sculpting an, an ancient Egyptian <laughs> dog or something like that. And she's explaining how she, she does it. But that's all in our Patreon community. So that's kind of what I'm, focusing on. I mean, obviously I want people to hopefully listen to me on Spotify and those things. Cause that's all part right. of, you know, keeping the machine running, but, um, yeah, anyway, I mean, that's just a, a the, it's just a brave new world out there for, for musicians and you don't have to have to be signed to a label in order to be successful. In fact, the idea is that you do so well on your own, which is kind of how labels are signing people these days. People are doing so well on their own because they, they know how to operate TikTok really well right. and get their songs out and they sing and next thing you know, they got a million followers. Labels are like, oh, they've already got an audience. It's all about building an audience. It, that's really what it is. It's just yes. finding people that are interested in seeing and hearing what you're doing. And there are a million ways to do it. It takes some time and work, but you can do it. 
mentoring is that yeah. on the horizon are you going to do that too <laughs> i do it's, I, I it just, sounds like that right yeah, I, mean, I mean it with, does with, it does with the well, knowledge that you have well i mean there are some people that are so much more knowledgeable than i am and i and, and i follow them oh. but uh yeah, but i do help a lot of the artists that i work with some of the younger ones that i might play producer on and or co-write right. or record do vocal stuff with i'm also try to help them too and say okay you've created this beautiful song how are you going to share this how are you going to let the world know what's your plan because a lot of time, us as artists sometimes we're so unaware of all the other things involved in getting a song out there. We're we're just thinking about getting the best performance down and getting a great song, and then we're like, yes, and it's like, okay, now what? Now what are you going to do, right? So that's the big the big thing these days is that there's there are a lot of ways that you can go to 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 share your music once you've created it. So I spend a lot of time with a lot of young folks yeah. and I say, okay, you know, make make a plan, think about these things. So now, let's bring it home. Yeah. Are you able to commit to a recording of a song that is produced and sung and performed by you? What you just confused me. What? So, are you able to commit? Yeah. To the final track recording of a oh, song. That's what you say. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my brain just couldn't even go there. I was like, no, no, don't. Shh. Um, I have a hard time doing that sometimes. I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, that, it's tough to know when to say when and to, to decide that you're, you know, it's good, it's good enough um, because you can spend a lifetime on just one song and, and never finish it. Um, and you can spend a year working on a song and, and you didn't make it better. You know, it's, you've gone laterally, you know, it's, it's just as good, but instead of being lemons, it's oranges, you know, and it's like, doesn't necessarily make it any better it's, but you spent a year getting from there to here so yeah i mean that that there's a um there's definitely a uh, a gift in being able to <laughs> say done next are you done me i'm definitely not done um yeah no i'm deep in the middle of, of making an album and it's taking a long time i mean you know covid and a lot of a lot of other kind of life things have uh have gone gotten in the way and and uh some health things and that kind of stuff but um yeah you know i'll get there i'm getting and, and, and but it's oh i've never gotten good at doing that i mean i let's be honest it's always been hard to do that and there's plenty of songs that don't even get me going ladies and gentlemen jr richard <laughs> Don't forget to point your phone at the QR code that you're seeing right now. And we'll have links in the description too. <laughs> oh, man. Gotcha. Thanks, man. Thank you. Ooh.